You know, it's so true that um, the Bible and all things that are of God become so real to us, more real than uh, than normally when we face adversity, when we face circumstances that are difficult, that are challenging, when we find ourselves in the middle of a trial. And, uh, you know, just the Word of God is, has, has be becoming more alive to me more than ever um, in, in this time of just this pandemic and uh, as I believe it has for for many of us, if not all of us, that are followers of Jesus Christ. And we know that we are um, also um, celebrating uh, Mother's Day uh, this morning, this Sunday. And so, um, you know, I just hope that uh, you've, you've had the opportunity already to, you know, to wish uh, your mother uh, a very... Uh, happy, grateful, thankful Mother's Day and, and how big of a role uh, mothers play in our lives and in, in our families, uh, especially those mothers uh, that, you know, have have given of themselves and given all they can. And we know that all do to whatever capacity they can. But, um, you know, I just think it's so important that we recognize uh, mothers, uh, especially just in this time and, and in this, uh, you know, situation that we're all going through and so uh with that uh let's just go ahead and pray and uh we'll uh we'll see what the ha- the lord has in store for us this morning heavenly father thank you again for your long suffering for your mercies that you give to us afresh every morning and we know that we aren't deserving of it we aren't deserving of your grace thank you that you forgive us through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, for we are saved by his stripes, Lord, and we're also justified, Lord. There is a positive uh, amount in our account uh, to you, Lord. No longer are we in debt, but we have a, a positive credit because of what your Son, Jesus Christ, has done for us on the cross. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just make yourself real to us like never before this morning, that we would just get a heavy sense of your presence in our lives and father that you would have your way in all the things um that are going on within our hearts lord obviously uh, we all need to repent there all is, uh, there's always a level of repentance that needs to happen lord there's a level of conviction that needs to happen there's a level of encouragement that we need as believers in christ and father i just pray that you would just enrich our relationship with you lord help nothing be above our relationship with you. Help our lives be centered around your son, Jesus Christ, and and, and us feeding our, our, our souls on your word. Help us to feast on the living water and the bread of life that will be the only thing that to sustain us. Lord, ultimately, everything else fails. And so, Father, please have your way this morning. Speak to our hearts, Lord. May you uh, speak through your servant. May it be uh, of the Holy Spirit and anything that's not of you, may it burn away now. In Jesus Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, so we are in Acts chapter 13 this morning, and we will be going through verses 44 through 52. And I've entitled this message, Jesus Christ is greater than than your opposition. Jesus Christ is greater than your opposition. Anything that you can go through in this life, the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than that circumstance or that situation. And in real time, in the heat of the moment, there may be instances and times where we don't necessarily feel that way or we may have a lapse in our faith, but the reality is Jesus Christ is greater than any of our opposition. And we can take heart in that. We can trust in that. We can uh, allow him to be the anchor of our souls and we can find our hope and find our true value in him, knowing that we don't have to waver and we don't have to be tossed to and fro because of the circumstances of our life. And so, I'd like to just uh, go ahead and read through these verses so we can get a better understanding of what actually was going on um, 
in this portion of Scripture. So let's go ahead and begin in verse 44. And it says, The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke up boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. Verse 52, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So in the past few messages, we've witnessed Paul explain the promise and the warning of receiving or rejecting Jesus Christ. And while many did respond positively to the good news, to the gospel message of the, the salvation that's found in Jesus Christ alone, today we will look at the other uh, the other side, the others who uh, rejected him and their response to God's message. The main points that I would like us to focus on this morning uh, are simply this, and I'll start with the first one. Envy creates opposition. The Bible is clear. Wherever there is jealousy and envy, there will be strife of every kind. There will be a lack of peace. There will be quarreling. There will be wars. There will be battling. There will be anguish. There will be a frustration. All of these things stem from jealousy and envy. The religious leaders couldn't handle the focus being taking, taken off of them and their actions showed it. Their actions proved that they, they couldn't deal with this. They were upset. They were frustrated because it was now Jesus Christ who was receiving the attention. Whenever we don't find our contentment in Jesus Christ alone, we invite envy to creep in our hearts, whether we are aware of it or not. The second main point this morning is, when being opposed, godly people do not have to cave in and give up. When Paul and Barnabas were opposed by the religious leaders, they didn't give up. Rather, they continued to share in the love and the truth in which they previously spoke of. They, they, they were able to derive from the, the well the living water, Jesus Christ, who was living in them through the power of the Holy Spirit to do this. We can't just throw in the towel, you see, as, as followers of Christ, just because times get tough, just because times are difficult. We are all walking, living through a difficult, a very difficult, if I, I could say the most difficult season of all of our lives right now. This is this pandemic is something we've never experienced before in our lifetimes. And so it poses many challenges. And I know that, um, you know, there's been reports and I've, you know, spoke with 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 some people that, you know, 
you know, they're having a very difficult time because of the isolation, because of, you know, for whatever reason, not being able to 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 interact with with people the way we normally uh, are accustomed to. And so there are many challenges. But as followers of Christ, we don't have to throw in the towel. We shouldn't throw in the towel. We shouldn't give up just because times are difficult. The third main point this morning is even when some or many won't listen, you as a believer, I as a believer in Jesus Christ can still be filled with the joy of the Lord. Amen. As Christians, again, we can't allow our circumstances to dictate our joy, whether or not we are filled with the joy and the peace of the Lord should not be dictated to us by our circumstances. Jesus Christ is greater than our opposition and our circumstances. All right, well, let's go ahead and look at the first two verses and we'll begin to uh, uncover the truth therein. So again, starting in verse 44 of Acts chapter 13, It says, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. The message that Paul preached was very, very powerful And very influential. So much that the following Sabbath, the text says, almost the whole city came out to hear the word of God. And it wasn't because back then there was only a limited amount of information for the people to hear. Meaning, well, they just came out because no one else was saying anything. So they figured, oh, well, let's just see what's going on. Granted, they weren't overwhelmed with information like us today right we have we have information overload we uh you know we uh we have the the internet we have radio we have television newspapers magazines etc right they didn't have any of this but they did have the same central problem all human beings from any time in any point in history had that is They were trying to find a way to fill the void in their hearts. They were simply in need of Jesus Christ. You see, the Word of God shares in its con when the Word of God is shared in its context correctly, in complete truth, this is the only thing that can truly satisfy. A person's hungry soul is what we find in the word of God. And what what is the word of God centered around? It's centered around the person of Jesus Christ and the purpose why Jesus Christ left the glory of heaven and came down to earth to the land that he created for his creation and the redemptive work that was done through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, that the 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 the, the Bible centers around this. And so when the Bible is shared correctly in context, this will fulfill a person's hungry soul. And this is the single reason why nearly all the city came out that following Sabbath because they got a taste of what Paul was saying and, and, and they needed to know more. They needed to understand the truth of this and the relevance of this in their own lives. And so they came back out because they had to find out more about this Jesus that Paul was speaking of. You see, Paul was offering them the only thing that would quench their thirsty souls. And maybe you've had your own experience in this and you can look in the media, you can look in, uh, there's many documentary stories of many influential, well-off people financially, uh, successfully in the world. And the reality is this, all the trappings of life can only satisfy your cravings and my cravings for only so long. Eventually, all these things lose their luster, these things wear off like a like a antidote that's supposed to 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 fix or heal you it only lasts for a certain time and then it wears off and eventually you'll be fiending for more i mean a simple example um, my son and and the fact that uh you know when there's fruit snacks 
all packed up somewhere in the house. He wants to eat fruit snacks all day. He loves the fact that, oh, you know, they taste good. They're, 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 they're sweet. They're chewy. They come in a little pouch. They're full of sugar. But you know what? The reality is he is not going to get full off of eating three, four, five fruit snacks at a sitting, let alone all throughout the day, they're empty calories. There's no there's no real nutritional value for his body. But if he was to sit down and actually have, you know, let's say a turkey sandwich with, you know, uh, apple slices and some peanut butter with something to drink with some water, uh, his appetite is going to be satisfied and, and he's going to be full. His, his body is going to get the real nourishment it needs from all those different vitamins and minerals that are found in the in the wheat bread, in the in in the turkey, in the in the apple, in the peanut butter, right? And this is the reality in our lives as well spiritually. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 2 tells us this. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. The point of the of this verse here is why do we buy things thinking that these inanimate objects objects, excuse me, are going to satisfy us. Now we know that an inanimate object is not inherently bad or good. It's just a thing, but when we place value on it that's not proportionate to what it is, then that's where the trouble lies. We we place we place some kind of eternal value on things that don't have that kind of importance and we wonder why they do not deliver. All these things are not eternal and they will honestly they're only going to burn up in the end. You and I cannot take any of these material things with us once we leave this earth. It's much better that we delight ourselves in the bread of life who is Jesus Christ. Notice the end of that verse says, eat what is good, delighting yourself in the rich food. Well, what is the rich food that the writer was talking about? Again, this rich food is the bread of life, who is Jesus Christ. He is eternal and will never change. He is the only one that can satisfy the longings of our souls. The living water, as he is as well. Once we drink of him, we will never thirst again, similar to the woman at the well. All that to say, even in our day, with all the distractions that we have, again, this, all the stuff with the pandemic, you can find yourself uh, on the internet or on the television looking at the news, and that's all they're going to report. You know, I suggest you catch the update of what's going on and then leave it at that. Don't don't sit there all throughout the day and have the news on here and all the the negative bad stuff going on because you know Satan will use that to try to get in your mind and mess you up and get you depressed and get you down. That that's how it works. You and I have to fill ourselves with with God's word and 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 meditate on that instead. But you see If we are distracted by all the things of this world and we engage in it, we're ultimately going to fail. But if we and and, and again, if we find ourselves today burnt out or we're weary or we're weak and we're wondering why we're like this and, and we're looking to our finances or we're looking to our sophisticated toys that we have and we're wondering why these things aren't working. Just remember that only Jesus Christ truly satisfies. Throw yourself into him and and what he represents and you won't be disappointed. You see, this stirring up of people's hearts within the city leads us to our first main point. And that's this. Envy creates opposition. When the Jewish religious leaders they saw the crowds flocking, coming by the dozens, coming, you know, just in droves to hear Paul preach. They were, they were not filled with, with gratitude. They weren't uh, encouraged by this. They weren't filled with anticipation of, of what was going to happen. Uh, you know, what was Paul going to say next? How were the people, how were the citizens going to react? They were filled with jealousy. How they regarded and looked at Paul, this is actually the same exact way they looked at Jesus Christ. And Jesus warned about this 
not only in Paul's day, but for us as well today. Because we find in John chapter 15, verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me first before it hated you. So Paul was aware that, that this was going to happen. But knowing these things, we need to ask the question, what actually led these people to envy and jealousy in the first place? Right. We, we, we have to ask ourselves this question because we want to uncover why were they this way? Why were they so frustrated? Why were they so uh, angry and mad and envious and jealous of, of Paul and the message that Paul preached? Well, the answer to this, it all boils down to the lack of contentment that they found in Jesus Christ. You see, these religious leaders are what the Bible calls whitewashed tombs. The outside, right? The outside of the cups were clean, but the inside was filthy and rotten. Their their outer garments, the way they presented themselves, the way they dressed, the way they had this mask of a facade was clean and nice and well kept, but the inside, the workings of their hearts, where their real character, where their real integrity was, it was filthy and it was rotten. And the only one that could clean that up was Jesus Christ. But they were unwilling to allow him to come into uh, their hearts. He was knocking at the door of their hearts, but they would refuse to let him in. And this was so crazy because they were the religious leaders. They were the ones who were supposed to have an honest, tight relationship with God. They were the ones, but yet they were the same exact people that were... Uh, not willing to even hear him, and they were opposing him. They were his enemies. The problem crept into their hearts as over time, somehow, some way, they fell in love with their position. They fell in love with their status. They fell in love with the attention and admiration from other people in which they received. And they fell in love with their wealth. And they didn't fall in love with the true and living God. You see, but... All of this, all of these things that, that they were guilty of and, and that we unfortunately could be falling victim of if we're not on point with our relationship with the Lord as well is this. It all goes back to that void that we all as humans were created with. The application is this. We need to nurture the God-given hunger that is built within us. That, that, is, that is that nagging thing that you can't you know no no vacation can 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 satisfy no amount of money can satisfy no amount of of illicit activity uh be it drugs be it sexual can can satisfy there's no amount of 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 jumping out of a, a you know a, a uh, an airplane and, and you know you're a thrill seeker no amount of that can satisfy that void within your heart and my heart it is only jesus christ anytime we try to satisfy ourselves with anything other than jesus christ we eventually will be feeling je- jealous and envious of others that's just a given it will happen at some point first timothy chapter 6 verses 6 and 7 tell us this But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. When Jesus Christ is allowed to take his rightful place upon the throne of our hearts, we are then able to actually be happy, filled with joy, be happy for others in in their successes in their lives. But when Jesus Christ is not the Lord of our lives, like these religious leaders, when we catch wind of others being used in a great way, we will grow jealous and envious and try to malfunction their efforts. We will try to throw a monkey wrench in what they're doing, or we will just oppose it, and we will not uh, we will, will not be grateful for them. We will not be happy for them. Um, you know, and I remember, you know, 
the other day, you know, when the NFL draft was going on, and um, anyone who follows the NFL knows that, uh, you know, Jalen Hurts, he had a, a, a quarterback for Alabama. He had a very uh, challenging, um, you know, time there. He was a, he was a two-year starter, and then, you know, he got a, he got benched at the halftime of the national championship, and then Tua, Tua came in, and he's a great, uh, great quarterback as well. And then, um, you know, Jalen ended up, you know, transferring his last year to to Oklahoma to play for the Sooners, and and both both men are are Christians and followers of Jesus, and so it's a super cool story if you ever wanted to find out the back end of what was going on. But um, Jalen Hurts got drafted uh, in the second round by uh, the Philadelphia Eagles, and you know, as I was watching, and you know, every everything is remote, you know, during during this draft, but you know, I found myself overjoyed for him, you know, happy for him, grateful for him, you know, um, you know, to the to the point where you know I shed I shed a tear or two, and it's not weird. It's just the fact that man, you know, I don't know that person personally, but I know that that person's a Christian, and and wow, that's awesome, you know. Praise God that he's able to experience that, and you know that there'll be some good coming out of it. But again, it goes back to. When you have a right relationship with Jesus Christ and he's allowed to be the Lord of your life, sitting on the, the, the throne of your heart, you're going to rejoice with other believers when they are successful. You're not going to be threatened by the fact that, oh, that person, you know, um, is doing great and well, look at my situation and you go comparing and then you feel sorry for yourself because you don't have what they have and you feel like you deserve it. That's 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 all a, a ploy of, of Satan. All right. Let's see where we're at. Um, lastly, we see here that the the jealousy of these religious leaders, right? The the jealousy towards Paul it caused them to to contradict the truth, and they were despising him. They they spoke out. They 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 opposed the message of Jesus Christ, and they despised Paul. And you see, jealousy does this. Jealousy, it's just again, it's such a ugly thing. The religious leaders they blasphemed the person of Jesus Christ by 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 standing against Paul and what Paul was teaching and preaching. This is a clear indication of someone being influenced by an unclean spirit. The application for us is this: as the word of God is shared in truth and in love, and someone still flat out rejects it, as hard as it is to hear, that person at that point in time is being influenced by the enemy simply because they're opposing the truth and the word of God. It all boils down to good versus evil. Trace it all back to the very beginning in heaven where the angels were with God. These angels were either for God or they were against him. Fast forward to our text today and the same principles apply. The Jews, they either stood for Jesus Christ or they stood against him. And we either take a stand for Jesus or we stand against him. Again, you have to remember the context of what's going on. While they're hating on Jesus so hard, it's a trip because they were waiting for their Messiah. They were waiting so long. But when he showed up, they were blinded. They couldn't even recognize that he was the Messiah of Israel and they rejected him. One of these reasons was because Jesus Christ was for the Jews and the Gentiles. Obviously, we know he came for the Jews first, but he also came for the Gentiles. But these religious leaders wanted to keep these two groups divided. They wanted to keep them separate. They thought of Gentiles as dogs and less of a human being, not even a whole person. And so they wanted nothing to do with the Gentiles. They couldn't handle hearing the fact that the Gentiles will become equal with God's chosen people. They wanted the favor. They wanted all of this. And they still received favor, but they, they were not happy with the fact that the souls of these dogs, as they so-called put it, could be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. And they wanted nothing to do with it. The reality was, this was just a simple act of racism. And the sad truth is, if God is willing to accept all people, hear me, all people who come to him seeking forgiveness, how dare we look down on anyone for the color of their skin or for the culture they come from or for how much or how little money is in their pockets. But this is what was going on with these religious leaders. All right, let's go ahead and continue in verses 46 through 48. And it says, and Paul And Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. 
Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. What a amazing uh, account of what went on here. Notice how Paul and Barnabas responded to this opposition brought upon them by the religious leaders. The text says that they spoke out boldly. Well, how did they get the strength to speak out boldly against these religious leaders? I mean, it probably was, it could have been very intimidating having uh, these religious leaders who are very influential, very powerful in, in, in the, you know, the land of Israel to be able to come to you and come at you in this manner where it's almost like the mob. It's like the religious mob. How, how did they find the boldness to speak out? Well, the strength and faith, it, it, it all comes from Jesus Christ. And the application is this. This is why it's so important for us to live a lifestyle meditating upon the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verses 4 and 5 tell us, For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, of the flesh, excuse me, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. You see, if we fail to have a daily ongoing relationship with God, then we will fail to take every thought captive and make it and to make it submissive to the authority of Jesus Christ. I'll put it even simpler. When we lose the battle in our minds, we also lose the battle in our actions. As you think, you will go. Your body's going to follow what your mind thinks. Your feet are going to follow what your what your mental is pointing and aiming directing at. Likewise, if we win the battle of our minds, we will win the battle of our actions, hence we can act out boldly in our lives for Jesus Christ. Paul and Barnabas were bold in sharing the truth of God's word to the religious leaders because they controlled their minds, they took every thought captive and they made it submissive to the authority of Jesus Christ. Paul was addressing the fact that the truth was to be shared with these Jews first, but since they chose to reject him, they actually passed judgment upon themselves through that objecting to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Then the word of God was to be taken to the Gentiles. This was all part of God's great plan of redemption for the world. When you really believe the truth of Jesus Christ, you will refuse to back down regardless of the opposition. When you've made it up in your mind, when you know in your mind and your heart that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, how he's revealed himself to you. Remember, it's a personal relationship. Nobody can cram it down your throat, cram it into your ears. The Holy Spirit has to illuminate your heart your mind to understand that he is who he says he is. But when you have that point of contact with God, and it's something that you know in your own experience, nothing else anyone else can say can stir you or make you get away from the, the truth that you know. It doesn't matter. And that's why you have martyrs. That's why you have people that will refuse to denounce the name of Jesus Christ and would rather die by whatever means their, their aggressors are trying to, to terrorize them before they, 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 they say, no, I'm going to turn my back on God because they know who Jesus Christ is. And this is what is going on here. The reality is if we find ourselves cowering away from opposition, it is because we are immature Christians. We need to grow in our faith so that we may be strong in Christ. Next, we see that the Gentiles heard this, heard this truth of they will be saved, those that choose to side with Christ, those who choose to receive Christ as their Savior, they will be saved. The Gentiles that heard this, they were glad and they glorified God. Remember the parable of the soils, right? 
This is what we actually, in essence, have going on here. For many of these Gentiles, the soil of their hearts was good. While for many of these Jewish religious leaders, the soil of their heart was bad. It, it, it was rocky or, or the seed got choked out by the weeds, the cares of this life. And it, and it wasn't good. The Bible is crystal clear that we are not to harden our hearts towards Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, just like in the times of these scriptures today, many choose to harden their hearts against the truth. Of Jesus Christ and for that you know all we can do is intercede for those and pray for them and pray that eventually the Lord will break their stony heart and give them a heart of flesh and they will re- they will receive him as their Savior they will see the error in their ways they will see that they are sinners destined for hell and that without him that's where they'll go and, and that they would uh, receive him and, and receive eternal life but that is the reality of what is going on that is the paradigm that we are in it's either we are with Jesus or we are against him okay let's go ahead and continue in verses 49 and 50 and it says and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. As we continue, we see the fruit of faithfulness of Paul and Barnabas, that the word of the Lord continued to spread even despite the opposition, even despite these religious leaders clamoring to shut them up and to get them out of their region. With an obedient vessel... The word of the Lord can never be stopped. You see, God can accomplish all of these things without man, but still he chooses to partner with his creation to accomplish his purposes. It's also important that it wasn't just Paul and Barnabas who were used to spreading the word of God, but it was those who received it as well. It was these Gentile people. It was those people who heard the message of redemption, the messages of salvation, and they received it gladly and glorified God. So how do they glorify God? Well, one, they received the truth of who Jesus Christ was in their own heart. And two, they had to have opened up their mouths and profess it to all those that they came across. So, you see, they were being used in, 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 in a great capacity, too, just as well as Paul and Barnabas. How is this significant to our lives today? Well, it's this. The application is, too many times, the church is simply just misinformed. We buy the lie that God only uses pastors or you know people that are ordained for, for ministry. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. The pastor, okay, yeah, has a specific role that's important to, to you know, take temperature checks and uh, make sure that the, the spiritual welfare of, of the body is, is doing well and, and to lead them in all truth towards Jesus Christ. But the growth and maturity of the church should never rest solely upon the pastor's shoulders. It rests upon Jesus Christ. Don't make the pastor Jesus. Don't, don't make him that. Please don't do that. Don't make a man take the place of the Lord Jesus. Now you should hear the teaching and the truth of Jesus Christ through a pastor, but don't make a man Jesus because that can never be and that's in a that's just not right. It also rests upon the shoulders of his body, meaning we all need to do our part. We then see that because of this revival, the Jewish leaders stirred up people of power to rebel against Jesus Christ. These these women and these men in high positions, they wanted them to, to oppose uh, the teachings of Paul and Barnabas. And this is what we see, again, because of the jealousy, because of the envy, because of the, 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 the fact that they were not getting the attention that they felt they deserved. They were stirring up their own people, people in positions of power, to, to, to exile them. And we see this here. They wanted Paul and Barnabas persecuted and exiled from their region. The application for this is wherever the Holy Spirit is moving heavily upon a people, the opposition of Satan will not be far away. That's just how it is. Punch, counterpunch. It's that's you're in a fight. You're never in a fight where somebody just backs down and gives up. We know Satan's not going to give up. He wants to drag as many to hell with them as he can. He knows his time is short. 
He knows that's where he's going, and that's why he's working so hard and so diligently to deceive people. The Bible says that he would he would deceive the, the elect if he could. So that's why, again, we go back to the point of what is our mind fixed on? Do we have the foundation of Jesus Christ as the center of our lives every day throughout the day? How do we start our day? How do we end our day? Are there times throughout the day where we refer to the Lord, where we're in prayer, where we're, you know... Uh, considering scripture these are these are things that are so important for the christian because that's the only way you're going to know the truth is by studying the truth and knowing the word of god and knowing what the bible says about the lord and knowing what the bible says about us as followers of christ it's very important there's nothing more important in your life and my life than having that great understanding and being able to exercise it by the way we live through our actions we need to understand that this is not a game. Jesus Christ and Satan are, are, for the lack of better terms, playing for keeps. I just said it's not a game, and I said they're playing for keeps. But it's true. Even though Satan is no match for Jesus Christ and the war has been won, because we are created with a free will, we can be persuaded in either direction. To give our lives to Jesus Christ or to give our lives to Satan. And it is still happening today throughout the world. Today, you and I must decide who will we serve? Will we serve the Lord or will we serve this world system? And we have to make the distinction. All right, let's go ahead and end <clears throat> with these last two verses. And it says, But they shook off the dust from their feet, speaking of Paul and Barnabas, against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the holy spirit back back then whenever a jewish person had to pass through a, a gentile city or a gentile town they would uh, when they left that city or place they would shake the dust off of their feet which basically meant we don't want anything to do with you we're we're, we're moving forward and we have no business here and Jesus taught this to his disciples as well. If you go to a place and, and they do not receive you, you are to move on and you are to dust your feet off and continue on to the next place appointed by the Holy Spirit. For Paul and Barnabas, this meant that they were moving on from constantly telling these specific Jews in this region about the gospel. After continued rejection, they were led by the Holy Spirit to now focus on the Gentiles who would gladly receive Jesus Christ. The application for us this morning is this. For us today, we may not do the, uh, you know, the traditional custom of dusting off our feet, but we need to make sense of what the situation is and move on if we felt, if we discern led by the Holy Spirit, we are to. This is more or less displayed in a way that we may not physically spend as much time with someone who has repeatedly rejected the gospel, but we still pray and intercede for their salvation. I know there's many touchy subjects. Someone will be like, well, you know, my, my family member, my a member, my husband, my son, whatever the case may be, you know, I keep sharing, you know, Christ with them and they're not receiving the Lord. Are you telling me to, 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 you know, reject them and not to, you know, follow after them anymore? No, not at all. But, you know, you can't force someone to, receive Jesus Christ as their personal savior. You can you can pray for them, you can intercede for them, which is very effective. Uh, that's actually probably the most effective thing you can do outside of, you know, initially sharing the truth of who uh, Jesus Christ is, is to you and to the world. I mean, they're going to know you're a Christian, so at some point it may even come across as you are shoving it down shoving it down their throat. And so in no way am I saying stop in praying for them, stop interceding for them, but you have to know as Paul and Barnabas knew it was time to dust off their feet and move move on to the next possible uh, potential person to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. But notice, despite all this, right, the whole thing of dusting their feet off, it really meant that they didn't give up because the text says that they carried their work to Iconium. Many Many times when the gospel is rejected, we could take it personal and we could feel as if we've been rejected and, and we can be upset about this, right? Um, this, this rejection 
can cause us to stop sharing the gospel. And and sometimes we feel and we end up keeping our mouth shut because we're like, well, what what's the point? I I've I haven't been used to to bring anyone to the Lord and people keep rejecting Jesus Christ and I'm outcasted and I'm not popular in in the circles that I used to be in and and you know, that's a very real reality that many Christians go through. But not Paul and Barnabas. They responded with more determination and continued to preach and teach the good news. The application is this. When we as Christians are confronted with rejection, we are not to give up. Rather, we are to pray asking the Lord for direction on where and who we are to go to next. The reality is we will face much opposition and difficult times in this life. If we simply shut down at the first sign of rejection, we will be of no use to the Lord and His purposes for our lives concerning our witness to the world. The truth is, those who reject Jesus Christ are doing just that. They're rejecting Christ. They're not rejecting us. We can't allow ourselves to take it personal. It's, it's, it's as the saying goes, though, don't, don't, uh, don't kill me. Don't take me out. I'm just the messenger. But we know, sadly, that many times the brunt of violence and hate is played out upon God's messengers. But this opposition never came without warning because Jesus Christ clearly warns us in Matthew chapter 10 verse 22, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And and though it seems as if that that's a very harsh statement, Look at the promise at the end of the verse. Those who endure to the end will be saved. That is beautiful. If you hold on and trust in the Lord and push through in his strength, you will be saved. And it's not going to matter who rejected the, the, the gospel. You know, it's not about that. It's about the fact that you stayed faithful after the Lord revealed how faithful he is to you and to me. Lastly, we see that the disciples were filled with joy of the Holy Spirit, or joy and the Holy Spirit, if I could say that. This is an awesome truth because you can't have one without the other. You see, it's a package deal. Being filled with joy and being filled with the Holy Spirit, they go hand in hand. The genuine happiness of a true Christian lies far beyond their earthly circumstances. True joy and peace given as a gift from the Lord is not affected by the good and the bad things that happen in our lives. You know, Paul spoke about this as well. He talked about he knew how to be content having much, having little. And that's the same thing here. It's not about our circumstances. The application is this. There will be times when we will emotionally feel great. And there's other times where we're emotionally a wreck and we feel crummy and cruddy and we just feel like we don't want to even get out of bed. But we we don't walk by sight and we don't walk by feeling. You see, we walk by faith. And faith is a choice to believe everything that God says is true. But we have to choose to believe that. We have to choose to side with that. We need to get better at praising God in our storms, right? It's easy for us to praise God when everything is going good, when everything is right. This is a storm right now. I hope you're in your place of residence and you're praising the Lord right now, not for the pandemic, but the fact that Jesus Christ is walking with you through this coronavirus situation, that he's never going to leave you, that he's never going to forsake you, right? We have to learn to get good at praising God through the storms of our lives and reaffirming his truth by speaking his word out loud. That's why it's so important to memorize scripture and you can praise the Lord through the reciting of scripture. It's not to say, look, I'm a big head and I know all these scriptures. It's it's for your benefit to protect your mind and your heart. There is power in the word of God. Amen. And that's why we trust in him so much and we praise him for not only what he's done for us, but also the fact that he's left us this truth that we can feast on every day and nourish our souls. All right, let's go ahead and pray and we'll end this message. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you again for your word. Thank you that, Lord, we can rest in your truth. Thank you that you've given us the ability to rightfully divide your word and see how it's so beneficial for us, Lord, how we have to make a choice that every person has to come to the place in their life where they decide, I am either going to be for you, Jesus Christ, or I'm going to be against you. Father, I pray for every soul 
that is hanging in the balance now, that is questioning, that is not sure of what they want to do. Father, reveal to these people, reveal to their hearts the importance of accepting your son Jesus Christ as their personal savior. There is there is no other important decision that they will ever make in their lives but that decision. Father, I pray that you would continue to save souls. Lord, bring those to your table that you are calling, Father. I pray that it would be from you, Lord, that they would truly identify with the fact that they need to be saved and that you're the only one that can save him. Uh, save them, excuse me, for those of us that are already uh, sons and daughters of yours. Father, help us to not grow weary as we are in a very challenging time, Lord, in, in, in the history of the world. Father, may we derive our hope, derive our strength, derive our energy from you. May the Holy Spirit speak to us in such a way Father, that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are not alone, that we are protected, that we have your peace that passes all understanding, and that we can rely upon the rock who is Jesus Christ. Father, continue to keep your hedge of protection around your people. May your hand be strong upon them. May you help us to walk through with our heads not held high in pride, but held high in the fact that we know that we serve the true and living God. And may our actions display that by how we treat the church and those around us. Father, we thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus Christ's precious name that we pray. Amen. God bless you, church.